Blair Beavers is the Education Coordinator and Assistant Director for the Johnson County Soil and Water Conservation District. She graduated from Indiana University School of Public and Environmental Affairs with a degree in Environmental Management in 2015. Immediately after college, Blair worked for Bloomington Parks and Recreation as a Natural Resource Education Specialist and began working for the Johnson County Soil and Water Conservation District in 2017. The district became an Indiana Ma Master Naturalist host for the Franklin area in 2018 and has continued to hold classes annually. In addition to hosting the Indiana Master Naturalist, she is the chair of the Johnson County Native Plant Partnership, which focuses on reducing the impacts of invasive species and promoting the use of native plants within the landscaping. Uh, to further that mesh mission, the district was funded by the Indiana Native Plant Society's Biodiversity Grant in 2021 to begin the Little Native Seed Library Trail, which she'll be talking about tonight. I'll now turn it over to Blair. All right. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Um, so... I will kind of just go over that a little bit. So um, yeah, I am the assistant director and the education coordinator for soil and water in Johnson County. Um, I tend to lean a little bit more towards the education rather than the assistant directing. Um, um, and I'm also on the steering committee for the Indiana Native Seed Communities as well. Um, so yeah, um, there's Nehemiah Garden there in Franklin. <laughs> um, so I apologize if you've seen me speak before, but I always like to do just kind of the background on why we care about native species before we really get into the meat of the presentation, just to make sure we're all on the same page. <laughs> um, so a native species is a plant or an animal that has evolved in a given place over a period of time and developed complex relationships. So what we really want to focus on are those complex relationships. Um, so to demonstrate that, um, the Carolina chickadee um, shown on your screen here they need 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to feed one clutch of hatchlings. So, um, and I think that may have even been upped recently for, to 9 to 12,000. Um, so that is one of those complex essential relationships that um, we really, really want to focus on fostering through our native species. Um, so to demonstrate that a little bit more, um, this is, um, this is host plants or host trees, I guess, um, and how many species of caterpillar or lepidoptera that they support. So if you want to do anything for our environment, plant an oak tree if you have the room, because they support over 500 different species of caterpillars. Um, so that meat more caterpillars means more chickadees. Um, so that is just demonstrating kind of that complex relationship that we wanna focus on. Um, so just because um, you can't really mention native species without um, kind of bringing us back down a little bit, um, Deb here, who's helping us out, uh, she likes to call me Bad News Blair because whenever we go on landowner surveys, I always give the bad news. Um, so an invasive species is a non-native species that causes harm to the environment, economy, or human health. Um, so I tend to focus on um, invasive plant species um, in my work. Um, along with fostering those native species. So 42% um, of the threatened or endangered native species can be linked directly to um, 
invasive species and the edging out of our native species. So um, once again, I'm just gonna keep reiterating those complex relationships. Um, this hinders those relationships um, because if you have a field of calorie pear or Bradford pear instead of an oak hickory forest, you don't have those relationships. Um, so threats to our environment to kind of demonstrate this a little bit further. Um, Invasive garlic mustard. Um, we've all seen garlic mustard. It's pretty uh, pretty much everywhere, um, but it is responsible for the decline of the West Virginia white butterflies population um, because this mustard is more pungent than our native mustard. So this butterfly is more attracted to the invasive garlic mustard, um, but their eggs cannot develop. Um, to full maturity on the invasive mustard as they can on our native mustard. So um, this means that their population is declining. Um, threats to our health. Um, so Japanese barberry, it's a very common um, landscaping plant. It is invasive though. Um, and when it uh, invades a woodland, um, you can see kind of how dense it is. Um, so that is the perfect habitat for ticks to um, breed and kind of take over. And the only thing that can navigate that are our rodents, so our mice um, and those species. So, so um, this can lead to 12 times the number of Lyme disease infected ticks um, per acre. Um, so this is, um, a really big threat to human health. Um, so I'm going to try to bring everybody back up a little bit, um, and focus on one of my programs that I absolutely love and the main reason that we are here tonight, um, and how to promote those native species over those invasive species and going native on our own properties. Um, so how this kind of works is um, the Little Native Seed Library Trail, as Bill mentioned, is um, partially funded through the Indiana Native Plant Society's Biodiversity Grant. So they covered the cost of, I think, four, yeah, four um, little free libraries. So if if you guys have seen those around uh, around um, your town or your area where that's just a, a little free library that has books usually in it or um, like a blessing box that has um, canned goods or um, non-perishables in it. Um, I saw those and I thought that's the perfect place for us to get some seeds out to um, the people of Johnson County. So um, how it kind of works is um, there are seven locations across Johnson County. Um, each one, um, the top shelf is the exact same. Um, so it has a starter packet in it in there with a passport, which you can see right here. Um, and in, it's also got instructions and all of that in that. Um, and it has an observation journal as well. So um, that one's a little bit more geared towards the kids, but adults can do it too. I think it'd be fun um, to kind of like draw your observations while you're at the different locations. Um, so you visit one of these little free libraries, grab a starter packet with everything that you need in there. Um, also within that library is a custom sticker. So all of my um, libraries are themed because I love a good theme. So um, they're all themed on different kinds of um, either pollinators or um, different topics uh, related to why we want to plant native plants. Um, and then, so with this sticker, you can place it on your passport that's in your starter packet. Um, and then if you visit every 
location in Johnson County, which there are seven again. Um, then I send out a free field guide to those who have visited every single one. Um, and it's usually just like a little pocket field guide. So like a flower finder um, or a berry finder. Um, but in addition to that, like I wanted one of my main goals with this program was to um, to be able to demonstrate what these plants will look like in different types of landscaping. So um, because when you first start out on this, as I'm sure you all know, it can be really, really overwhelming and you don't know how all of these native species are going to interact and um, look because a lot of people are really afraid of them getting weedy. So I kind of wanted this trail to demonstrate a nice variety of different landscaping options with native plants. Um, also in there is um, on the inside of the library door. Um, it's just a window cling that has a QR code to it to that links to our website and it's got a whole informational page on that library's theme. Um, I apologize in advance for the terrible pollinator and nature puns that are riddled in that website. I had way too much fun making it. Um, so, uh, but, uh, it was kind of nice to be able to touch on a lot of different topics, um, that way, which we'll discuss a little bit more here, um, coming up. Um, and then, like I said, hold on to your passport, visit them all throughout the summer. It's open from May 1st, usually, um, to October 31st, so that we hit all the bloom seasons, um, and then uh, if you put all seven stickers on your passport and there is a drop box on each library, you can just put it in the drop box and uh, write your name, your email, and your phone number, and I will contact you to get that um, pocket field guide. Um, so, yeah. All right. So, I'm gonna go through our different locations now um, for the libraries. And this has been really a widespread, very connected um, network of partners that I have um, kind of roped into um, helping me with this, with this project. So, one of our locations is the Trafalgar branch of the Johnson County Public Library. They have a really nice, um, you can kind of see it down here on the bottom, but a paved path that walks through and winds through a prairie um, that they have um, installed on their property. Um, this is the Benefits to Birds um, Library. So um, so this one was really just demonstrating what it would like be like to, you know, if you have a little bit more property and you want to in, install something like a pollinator, um, full-blown prairie pollinator kind of uh, field or patch, um, and how that can help our native bird species, which I will go over a little bit. Um, at the end of the presentation as well. Um, but each one is themed and each one has artwork on it as well. It was done by a, a really awesome local artist um, in Franklin. Um, uh, her name is Nicole Marshall. Um, and uh, yeah, she just, she was really great to work with. And each one is, I mean, absolutely beautiful. So I was really, really happy with how they um, how they turned out. So this is the Trafalgar branch. Um, and this one has, uh, each one has um, flyers as well in the library that uh, kind of goes with the theme. So there's a flyer in there that um, talks about gardening for 
um, using native plants to help our bird, our native bird species. And then um, I also usually have a, like a kid's activity in each one too, if I can find the right kind of kid's activity. Um, so this one I think has like an Audubon um, like activity booklet in there as well. Um, so next, this one is called Bumbling Bees. So this one is at Johnson County Park, which Johnson County Soil and Water is a co-owner of Johnson County Park. So we actually paid for this um, library um, as a match for the grant um, since we are owners of the land. Um, and we planted this landscaping for McLean Cabin, um, which is a horse historic cabin out at Johnson County Park um, in 2017. So it was my first year um, working for soil and water, excuse me. Um, and we planted with ecologic native plants and um, just kind of surrounded the cabin with, you know, what it would have looked like um, back when. So, yeah. Um, all right. So this one is our office. Um, so Johnson County Soil and Water. I decided to uh, claim the Milkweed and Monarchs theme for myself. Um, <laughs> so this one, of course, is all about how uh, milkweed is the host plant of the monarch butterfly and what we can do to get the um, population to rebound. Um, this one has, um, so each, I guess I forget, forgot to mention this one, each library has two different species. Um, of native seed in the library. So this one does have common milkweed usually um, in there um, to kind of get those seeds out to the public so that we can help those monarch butterflies. Um, and each, each species that is in a library, um, I made sure that it is reflected out in the landscape. So um, if that species of, um, if, if that flower or that seed is in that library, it is out in that landscaping as well, just to make sure that you know what it's going to look like, because I also have bundle flower <laughs> in, um, Illinois bundle flower in this library. And as some of you probably are very familiar with, um, it does spread quite a bit. So I want to make sure that people are aware of how it acts. Um, and that's pretty obvious at my office. <laughs> I have no shortage of the uh, Illinois bundle flower if anyone needs some uh, <laughs> some new seedlings. Um, and there's this little guy with his, uh, his completed passport. You can see all of those stickers on there. Um, and he's standing in front of the Dropbox, but um, yeah. All right, so this one is the Greenwood Public Library. Um, it's a little bit confusing because I partnered with the Greenwood Stormwater Department on this one. So it, the library is actually located in one of the stormwater's bioswales, but it is um, basically connected to the Greenwood Public Library's parking lot. Um, and Old City Park is right there as well. And they have a prairie um, managed by Ecologic um, over there as well. So there's um, no shortage of native plants around that area. Um, but I did partner with the stormwater um, department um, for this one. And this one is plants and pollinators. So I tried to focus a little bit more on this one about how, um, how our native species benefit more than just, you know, our, the monarch butterfly. Um, tried to make it a little bit more uh, widespread and far reaching. Um, so 
Yeah, and this one has a nice little coloring page in there and how to garden for pollinators. All right, so you can't, uh, it would be a missed opportunity, I guess, if we didn't have a location at a rain garden. So this one is at um, Purdue Extension of Johnson County. They actually held a workshop to install this rain garden quite a, quite a long time ago. I know Deb was there, but I'm not sure what year it was. Um, but, um, you know, they did the whole nine, disconnecting the downspout, making it lead to the rain garden. Um, and it is very well established. So this one is um, called Rain and Drains. So this one is really about how um, rain gardens can, you know, mitigate pollution, provide habitat, um, all kinds of things. Um, so, yeah. Um, Franklin College uh, is the sixth one on our list here. So on campus, on the, at the Science Center um, on Franklin at Franklin College, they have a rain garden that was installed by a biology teacher, um, our biology professor, um, a few years ago. Um, and you can see this little girl visiting the What Are Wetlands Library. Honestly, this is my favorite Nelly. artwork out of the entire trail. Um, I wish I would have put one that kind of zooms in on it. Um, but uh, yeah, this one was really nice because it's got a little bit more diversity to it. It's got more sedges, more... Um, yeah, just, uh, I guess a little bit more height and a little bit more variation to it. Um, so this one really just demonstrates what, what the benefits of our uh, wetlands are in Indiana because a large portion of the state used to be wetlands and unfortunately they are on the decline. So um, yeah, just kind of highlighting wetlands and why we want to protect them. Um, all right, so this one, there are no seeds in. I would not do that. Um, I'm not gonna give away invasive seeds. So this one is called Wrangling Weeds. Um, so it's at Johnson County Park, um, which again, we are co-owners of, uh, the Soil and Water District is. Um, and Johnson County Park, has no shortage of invasive plants, some of the biggest honeysuckle you will ever see in your life, um, because it is located right across from Camp Atterbury. So um, it is all old military land. So the entire park was disturbed, um, which we all know is the perfect breeding ground for our invasive species. Um, so this one really just has information on those invasive plants, um, weed wrangles, and like how you can get involved with all of that. I just kind of wanted to highlight, bad news Blair, wanted to highlight, um, you know, what we can do about our invasive plants. Um, and you can see this is us at a weed wrangle um, right in front of the library. Um, uh, so yeah. and you can see just how big that honeysuckle is. So um, it is at our weed wrangle site um, and we will continue working there this year um, to try to clear that area of um, the invasive plants. And this one's a little bit difficult to kind of get people to understand because it doesn't really, it doesn't quite have the same I guess, beauty of some of the other landscaped areas, um, but you can really see where we've taken out the honeysuckle and the gray dogwood has started to come back. And some of those native species are really, really starting to fill in those spots where the honeysuckle is now gone. Um, so I really wanted to demonstrate what a restoration site 
um, looks like and how it progresses over um, time. All right, so um, I'm assuming that if you are on this program, you know most of this, but hopefully I can just do a little bit of a refresher. Um, so, because I don't want to give away these seeds and someone just put them on the shelf or in the fridge and forget, forget about the seed packets. So I try to give as much education as possible on how to utilize these seeds. Um, so scarification, so I can never say it. This is required for the species in the legume family, <laughs> that Hoosier accent. Um, so that really just is scratching the surface of the seed to make sure that the water um, can um, break through that kind of waxy coating um, to allow germination. Um, I always apologize during this portion of my presentation because I have to say moist a lot. And um, I know a lot of people do not like that word, so I'll try to I'll try to limit it. But um, cold, moist stratification. So um, this is basically just tricking seeds into, um, into thinking they went through winter. Um, is kind of how I, I think about it. Um, so you can do that through the fridge um, or you can do it naturally by putting them outside. Um, light requirement. So I don't know if anyone has ever handled like cardinal flower seeds, which is this lovely plant right here, favorite of the hummingbird um, or the ruby throated hummingbird. Um, but they are teeny, teeny, tiny. I mean, basically like dust. Um, same with like foxglove, beard tongue, if anybody's dealt with that one as well. Um, so those are seeds that you do not bury. You just put directly on top of the soil. Um, and finally, there are some that do not require any pretreatment at all. So I downstairs right now have an entire little terrarium greenhouse of native grasses that are sprouting in, on my kitchen counter. Um, so I did not do anything to those seeds. You just put them into moist soil, um, make sure it's in a warm spot with a decent amount of sun and those will germinate um, on their own without any of these extra steps. Um, so fridge stratification, um, Personally, I don't know how many of you are from Bloomington, but I like to save my like plastic containers that I get from like Blooming Foods, like if you get like chicken salad or whatever. Um, but anything like that, I like to save those. And then I will put um, my seeds on the uh, moist paper towel, um, put it in that container, and then you can just write directly on the container, throw it in the fridge, um, forget about it for 30 to 90 days, and then you can plant um, directly into soil, warm soil. Um, so that's fridge stratification. Um, I apologize, you get to see my messy office. Um, <laughs> on this slide, but um, seed trays. So this is um, I did some fridge stratification a couple of years ago and then um, or someone donated me or donated seed to me that had been in a shed um, all winter. And so in February or March, I just put them in my office window. Um, and this is uh, what happened, which was a nice um, kind of surprise as it was one of my first years kind of experimenting with this. Um, so yeah, just putting them inside or you can just plant them in a starter tray and put them outside in January or February. I purchased um, through a different grant, um, cold frames that do not have, don't have the, pla they have a removable plastic cover on them, but they are screened instead of 
fully having plastic covers over them. So those cold frames have been the easiest thing I've found so far for germinating um, native seed because I can just plant in December or January, put all of those plants out in my screened uh, cold frames. They're all exposed to the elements and then they can just kind of naturally go through their cold snap and in the spring, they germinate on their own. And then by the fall, I have um, decent sized uh, native plant plugs. So um, highly, highly, highly recommend um, any type of outdoor screened kind of um, cold frame or greenhouse. Um, it's been very helpful. <laughs> Um, so milk jugs, I just did this for, oh, look, my, my video worked. <laughs> um, so milk jugs, I just did this for three hours on Sunday. I don't know if it'll be too late, but we're going to try it. So, um, once again, January, February, um, put milk jugs outside. Um, uh, you cut them in half, poke drainage holes in them fill them up with about three to four inches of soil. Um, and then you can plant directly in them. Um, and it kind of acts as like a mini greenhouse. So in the spring, this is kind of what you'll have. Um, and then uh, two or three weeks later, you have a full blown uh, mini forest on your hands. Um, this is Minarda um, that I had grown. Um, Bradbury's Monarda, so not um, bee balm, but um, Bradbury's Monarda. Um, one thing I will say that I learned from this specific year of <laughs> um, milk jug uh, germination, I labeled all of these with a purple Sharpie. Don't do that. <laughs> it washes off. It fades. Um, highly recommend doing a black Sharpie um, or a black permanent marker. Um, so that's our milk jug method. Um, and then this is sowing directly into soil. This is not my favorite, um, method of starting native seed. Um, just because I like to be a little bit more particular and, um, I guess, careful with what I'm planting um, because in the spring it's really hard to tell the difference between like those teeny tiny plants that are just popping up. So I like to label and know everything that I have planted, but um, if you're a little bit more carefree, I say go for it. Um, so in the fall, prep your area by weeding or tilling just this once. Um, and then you can plant those seeds directly into the soil um, in the late fall after the first hard frost. Um, and then you can wait until the spring and um, see what germinates. Um, and keep an eye on it because especially if you till, you could be activating, you know, invasive species seeds. So just make sure this one, you have a little bit more of your thumb on what's happening. Um, and keep lists. <laughs> very, very important. Keep a list of all the species that you uh, planted. All right. Um, kind of to go along with the rest of this, um, if I give away all of these seed packets, I want to know that people are, you know, kind of treating their native planting and they, you know, they know how to kind of care for it because this is a lot of information that I throw at people really, really fast. So um, making sure that, you know, you have the information and the tools to get through every step of your native garden and caring for it. Um, so if you plant from seed, don't expect it to bloom in the first year. Um, and if it does, that's a nice surprise, um, but don't expect it to. So your native plants will sleep um, during year one, they will start to creep in year two, and then in year three, they leap. 
Um, so that means that's when, you know, those root systems are really starting to talk to each other and you're all of your kind of bare soil, um, all of those kinds of, you know, areas really start to fill in. Um, so um, make sure to walk and check your planting at least twice a year to avoid uh, in invasive species. I personally am still battling winter creeper in my native gardens out at the office. So just make sure that you're staying on top of all of that. Um, and, you know, because this all, all those kinds of species are just constantly in and um, in our, you know, our areas and places that we don't want. So make sure that you check for those and spot treat in the fall after your native plants have gone dormant. So um, that way you can treat your invasive species a little bit more um, carefully so that you are not affecting your, um, your native plantings. Also, you know, make sure that you're, you know, you can also do, you know, don't spray or mow signs if it's anywhere where you think that might be an issue. I personally need some because my, my plants keep getting weed whacked by very well intending um, Franklin Parks. So um, uh, just make sure, you know, you have a, a, a don't spray or mow sign um, if at all possible. Um, because also we have, we've had our um, AC units out at the building um, serviced and my first year after planting, they did spray um, a bunch of herbicide in there. Um, so just make sure you're constantly communicating with any, you know, lands or landscapers or surrounding area um, contractors, anything like that. Just make sure that they know and are aware of what your goals are. <laughs> um, so cleaning up your native garden, basically just don't. I know that's really hard for us, um, especially now when it's starting to warm up. We all want to get out there. We all want to um, start cutting things back and cleaning it up and making room for all of those new seedlings that are coming up. Um, but I like to wait until late April or early May because there are um, there are our solitary our native solitary bees use the hollow stems. Um, of our native plants to overwinter. Um, so those stalks provide shelter for them. Um, if you absolutely have to clean up your garden, you can leave those stalks up to two to three feet off the ground. So you can just cut off the tops um, and make it a little bit more clean. I did that with our our sign here behind me um, this year because I keep getting in trouble with the city. Um, so I cut off all my gray headed cone flower um, to kind of clean up the front of our sign, but I left about two to three feet to keep that habitat there. Um, you can also cut down your stalks and pile them um, in different areas uh, of your yard to keep that habitat going. And then if you really, really have to clean up your garden, if you have an HOA, um, anything like that, um, you can always get a, a bee box or a bee house um, for those solitary bees. Okay. So this is one of my favorites, uh, white turtle head. I love watching bees kind of crawl in there. Um, it's some great pollination happening. Um, this is at the Greenwood Public Library in one of their bioswales. They just have strips of white-headed coneflower, or yeah, white cone, or no, not white coneflower, white, white turtle head. There we go. Um, and the bees absolutely love it. So benefits to bumblebees. This is some of the information that is in my Bumbling Bees library. So limiting the use of pesticides, especially in the spring or early summer, because um, that's when queens are really um, vulnerable. Um, and also not cleaning up an area of your yard to make sure you provide habitat for those um, hibernating queens because, oh, I didn't put that one in there. 
um, because they are the only surviving um, uh, member of that nest. So they need uh, the habitat throughout the winter to um, overwinter. So leaving kind of a messier part of your yard provides them that habitat in the winter. Um, so this is the information in our Trafalgar, Trafalgar library. Um, so benefits to birds. Um, we've all seen goldfinches on purple cone flower eating the seed. So um, that's another reason to leave your stocks up over the winter. Um, gives them some habitat and some food sources throughout the winter. Um, also, removing invasive species. Um, I like to call uh, bush honeysuckle a bird donut because it does not have the proper nutrition for our native birds. Um, so it can be, it is actually linked to smaller clutch sizes, um, uh, those berries, because they'll gorge themselves on those berries, but it's mostly sugar. Um, instead of the protein and the um, other things that our birds need for nutrition. Um, also, honeysuckle does not have the correct structure. If you look at honeysuckle compared to like a silky dogwood, a silky dogwood is very full. It's got, um, it's got branches all the way down. Um, but if you look at a honeysuckle, it's a little bit more fountain shaped. So that makes it more accessible to predators. So like raccoons, possums. Um, so if a bird nests in that honeysuckle, it is more likely to be um, affected by predators. So um, how you can kind of apply all of this. Um, if you go to our little native seed library trail and get some seeds and would like advice, um, check your local um, CISMA. So that's our Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area to see if they provide landowner surveys. We do in Johnson. So um, usually me and Deb will come out to your property. We'll walk it with you for about an hour, hour and a half talk about your goals um, and um, kind of identify areas where you can remove invasive species, what would be a good area for a native planting, what kind of species you would like to see there. It's a great free resource. Um, so make sure you um, check out your local CISMA and you can do that through SICM. And I don't remember acronym right now. So it's S-I-C-I-M for anybody who is interested to see if you have um, one of these grassroots groups um, in your area or your county. Um, go to a strike team event or a weed wrangle. Um, Indiana is kind of on the cutting edge, the groundbreaking um, I guess the brown, groundbreaking state for how we do weed wrangles in Indiana. Um, there have been hundreds, if not thousands over the last couple of years. Um, so go to a weed wrangle. It's really um, satisfying to hack up some honeysuckle. If you're ever frustrated one day, you feel like you need a little, um, little uh, manual labor therapy, um, a weed wrangle is a perfect place to do that. Um, uh, and it, we always teach how to identify these things at the weed wrangle, how to treat these things. Um, and if you have any questions there about native plantings, um, you are more than welcome to uh, ask there as well. So our next one is Earth Day weekend, I believe. Um, Friday, April 21st, we are in a partnership with um, Franklin College. So um, their research property, we've been really, really hitting hard um, out at Huffam Woods. So that's been really, really nice to see. Um, so if there is anyone interested in starting your own seed library, I kind of threw together this slide um, because 
Uh, it is a lot of work. Um, I won't sugarcoat it. It's a lot of work, um, but it is so awesome to see how many people have learned and um, contact me about these libraries that I have put out in Johnson County um, because it's not, it's, it's education that is done on your own time. Um, there's no timeline really to it other than, you know, a summer. Um, and it's kind of self-guided. So it's been really, really rewarding to see everybody who has completed a passport and actually used these seeds on their um, property and have taken the time to contact me and tell me about it. So um, if you want to start your own, uh, seed collection is key. It is uh, make it a priority in the fall. Um, we personally host a native seed collection day out at Johnson County Park. Um, so that's where we get a lot of seed, not all of our seed, but, um, and make sure when you're collecting, you only want to take 10 to 30% um, from that plant or that area. No more than that, um, just because you want those things to reseed. So um, keep that in mind when you're collecting. Um, volunteers and time are essential for processing seeds. Deb knows this all too well. Um, it is a lot of work to process seeds, especially if it's a smaller seed. Um, everybody has experienced milkweed fluff sometime in their life, I'm sure. Um, so it's it's a lot of time. Um, but you know, I I process seeds while I'm watching my terrible reality TV or whatever it may be. Um, just as kind of something to have to do while, um, you know, I, I'm just to keep my hands busy while I'm, I'm watching some terrible TV or whatever it might be. Um, also, if you're purchasing seed, um, this is way over my head, but order as local as possible because um, people who are a lot smarter than me and know a lot more and have a botany degree and all of that say to go as local as possible on the genotype. So Roundstone Native Seed is a great place to order seed from, or um, Spence Restoration Nursery is another good place. Um, both of those are awesome places to order um, seed from because they are a local genotype, um, which I can't tell you the intricacies of that, but um, other botanists can. <laughs> Um, coin envelopes and envelope moisteners are your best friends. Um, so I have thousands and thousands and thousands of coin envelopes everywhere, um, which is how I make my seed packets. Um, and I label them with shipping labels that I create myself. So I just print and create them myself. And then finally, just make sure you track and you label everything when it comes to seed. Um, common name, scientific name, the type of germination that and cold mo or cold moist stratification that it needs, um, how many seed packets you've made, the year it's collected, um, because all of this, when you're collecting and you're kind of just throwing things in your car, I personally keep like envelopes in my car. So whenever I come across native seed, I just kind of I'm like, oh, that looks interesting. Let's <laughs> let's see if I can germinate that. Um, so uh, make sure you label as much as possible. Some I can't even tell you how many paper I have around the office where I'm like. I think uh, we've got Blair froze. Yeah, it looks like that. Yeah. You, there, there she comes. There she comes. Oh, uh, you froze and up. By the, okay. And by the, uh, it looks like you're winding up, but we're at yeah. 625. Great. We are good. 
Um, so if you have any questions, just let me know. If you have any questions about starting your own library, um, seed library, you can contact me at the email on the screen. Um, that goes directly to me. Um, and if you want to see the website and read my bad puns, um, it is on the Johnson County Soil and Water website um, for the program. Um, all of those informational web pages. <laughs> so yeah, thank you all for coming and attending. And if you have any questions, now's the time, I guess. <laughs> well, Blair, thanks so much. By the way, have, am I unmuted? Let me check. You are. You are. Okay, great, great. Thanks so much. I'm I'm struck by the creativity of the project and and the beauty of it. Um, not from the boxes to the the gardens that you all are doing. It's just really terrific. And I I, I appreciate so much that you are willing to share it with us tonight. Yeah. Or you were, and it, we do have a couple of questions. Let yeah. me see here. Um, let me go back up. I moved down. Uh, 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 Susan Lawson was asking about, uh, uh, I, I think it was in relation to, uh, well, she asks, plant outside like like this, even though the seed packets say after frost. And I, um, maybe it was around the stratification. And Susan, you're welcome to unmute and, uh, and uh, uh, communicate that a little bit better. And, and it's okay if you if, if you're uncomfortable doing that, but I yeah. think it's regarding uh, uh, I planting believe, in the winter time the the winter sowing maybe. I believe it was with the the winter jug uh, um, method is going ahead and putting seeds out even though it says after frost if they're somewhat protected. I think that oh. was what it was in relationship to. Yeah, um, so sorry, you guys froze again a little bit. Um, so it, I usually, yeah, if it's in a milk jug, um, it is protected. It kind of uses its own little greenhouse um, is kind of how I explain it to people. It's like its own little um, almost ecosystem <laughs> a bit. Um, so it should be protected enough that it'll germinate. Um, I just like to put them out in really early January because it's been so weird lately. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers. The yeah, and I, and, and I think uh, but with our native seeds, they're used to going through the winter. So uh, they that's why they've, many of them have that requirement for the, the cold moist treatment. So uh, mm -hmm. they don't even need the jugs really, but the jugs work pretty well and they, they will act as a little bit of a greenhouse and add a, a, a little bit more warmth and you'll get earlier germination and so forth. But but yeah, terrific. A any other questions? Uh, let me see here. I think they're there. I think that- uh, 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 One more came in, Bill. Oh, okay, go, go for it. Uh, go ahead, read uh, it off. Uh, Blair, uh, Linda wanted to know if you have a full list of the native plants at each of the uh, libraries, uh, the ones that are actually growing there or at each site. I do. Um but it's pretty extensive. <laughs> um, so I have a, a, uh, an Excel sheet with each site on it and everything that those sites have planted. Um, but it's like four or five different sheets on that Excel sheet um, of hundreds of species. So, I mean, I'd be happy to share it. Um, but if you were talking about just the species, <laughs> that are in the libraries, that should be on the website. Um, I still need to update it for this year, but um, if you're looking for the seed packets that are in those libraries and what the species are, um, that should be on our website. It would be uh, good just to thinking out loud, Blair, is to maybe, I know we have seeds at each of the boxes, but not necessarily seeds for every single native that's at that location that may be mm -hmm. a, a little uh, like bookmarker or something all the plants that are visible something mm -hmm. to think about but 
Yeah, I do have on the website as well. Um, there are pictures that I have taken at each site. Um, the first year of the trail, I really tried to take as many pictures as possible um, while I was going, because I usually check the libraries about weekly or bi-weekly to make sure, you know, there's no vandalism, there's nothing like that. Um, we have had a couple incidents of that. Um, so, um, and Deb, she checks the one in Greenwood for me. So she knows that, you know, we get, we get tons of books in there, you know, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> um, so, um, but I, I really tried to document each bloom season at each site. So those pictures are on the website as well with the corresponding library. All right, I think that's all the questions. Well, we'll go ahead and um, go ahead and close it now. Uh, um, now, if you have any other questions regarding the presentation this evening, uh, you have received uh, Blair's information. Uh, also, um, we um, the, the, her whole presentation, we will put it on the Trello board uh, in the not too distant future. So, so you'll have that, you'll be able to go back to it. And Blair, if you have any other things you'd like to share, we can put on there. Uh, so anyway, you can contact her. You can also contact the Indiana Native Seed Communities uh, through uh, seed at indianavenativeplants.org. And uh, we've shared uh, our, uh, our information as well in the chat. Um, let me see what else I have here. And I, I invite you to go to our Facebook group if you're not already on there. Uh, we welcome any pictures, any videos, and uh, especially about how your propagation is going or any programs you may have in your community. And if you have a uh, program in your community that you'd like to highlight, uh, we'd love to talk to you about it. Maybe we could do, uh, do one of our uh, monthly uh, sessions. Uh, the, spotlighting that. Uh, so um, we'll also be doing uh, communicating this in the very near future, but Autumn Brunel, who's the naturalist at the Moreau County um, Parks and Recreation, she'll be speaking about how to prepare your bed for those seed grown plants that you, you've grown. So I hope you can join us uh, at that time. It'll be March 27th at 5.30. Uh, and I'd like to thank Blair once again. I'd also like to thank Deb Housen for helping with the technical aspects. And Deb, appreciate all that you're doing as well and helping uh, Blair with the, with the project there. Um, uh, it was good to see you all. Uh, we'll sign off for now and happy growing native plant.